Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to be reading From the Boy Who Dared by Susan Campbell Bartoletti. We're starting on page 147, right at the bottom of the page break, right here. Let's get started. <clears throat> Helmuth sits on the floor beneath the window in a square of sunlight. He can barely breathe when he thinks what lies ahead. He focuses his mind, doesn't want to be numb, wants to think, to feel. He listens to the sounds of prison. From the hall, a metallic clattering sound, doors opening, doors closing. From another cell, sobs. From a passing guard, footfalls. From the prison yard, the tramp of feet. From the city, sirens. The square of sunshine moves, diffuses, grows faint yellow. Helmuth feels lost in a dream. Carl and Rudy enter the dream. Their faces float in front of him and then fade out and enter again. First one, then the other, and then the three of them together. Morning. The slot opens. A cup of brown liquid and a hunk of dry bread. Helmuth gulps the liquid, gobbles the bread. He can no longer avoid the overflowing slop bucket. Later, footsteps outside the cell door. Helmuth stands in anticipation. The slot slides open. Eyes meet his. The slot slams shut. A key turns in the lock. A rasping, grating sound. Metal against metal. The door swings open. A guard looms in the open door. Out, he says, motioning with the rubber truncheon. Back to police headquarters with you. Helmuth falters. But I've already confessed. The guard's mouth tightens. Wham! His truncheon strikes Helmuth in the stomach so fast he doesn't see it coming. It doubles him over, knocks the wind out of him. Helmuth groans, clutches his belly, the sour taste of vomit. He swallows it down. Guess you didn't tell them enough, says the guard. Hands on head. It stabs to stand up straight. Helmuth clasps his hands on top of his head, walks, elbows sticking out like wings. He plods down the corridor, outside to the transport van. Gestapo headquarters. Helmuth awaits his turn for interrogation in a room painted a brilliant, dazzling white and brightly lit with large lights. It's called the Hall of Mirrors, a Nazi joke, Helmuth supposes, because there are no mirrors. All around, blue-clad prisoners stand at attention, noses one inch from the white wall, never moving, never flinching. One hour, two, more. Helmuth's legs ache, his stomach burns, he feels faint. His mouth is dry, needs the toilet, worries he cannot hold it, doesn't want to think about the trouble that that will cause. His name is called. The Gestapo interrogation room has a concrete floor, round metal drains, a hose looped in the corner, dark splatters, dried blood, across whitewashed walls, a lingering scent of disinfectant. In the center, a wooden table, two wooden chairs. We know you didn't work alone, says Wangemann tapping his truncheon against his palm. But I did, says Helmuth. This time, Helmuth expects the blows, the kicks, the grind of boots. The transport van carries him back to Fool's Battelle, where the guard clamps his hands and feet in metal bands, cuffs the bands to the bed. For stubborn ones, says the guard, you're a tough one. Most crack within 24 hours. Maybe you'll give a better answer tomorrow. Helmuth lies spread-eagled on the boards, his face, back, shoulders, buttocks, legs. They burn, burn, burn. He prays, not for deliverance, but for strength. He will not crack, must hold out. No names. Another interrogation. Helmuth gasps for breath. Each breath burns. His whole body feels on fire, and he cannot hold out any longer. Cannot stop himself as he croaks. Karl Heinz Schneeb, Rudy Wobb. Helmuth sits on the edge of the cot, head in his hands, and sobs. Huge, racking sobs. He hates himself, hates what he has done. If only he held out. If only they had killed him. Helmuth wishes he could kill himself, but how? He has no shoelaces, no sheets. He lies on a cot, stares at the ceiling, holds his breath and gasps, gives up, clutches his throat, squeezes, hard, gasps again, tries again. Harder, no use. And then he realizes he can't die. He mustn't die. He must live. Live to take the blame. Live to save Carl and Rudy. The SS sit at a large table in the middle of the room, talking, laughing, shuffling papers. 
Helmuth tunes out the guards, narrows his eyes to slits, blocks out the dazzling walls, stands, nose one inch from the wall. Nothing phases him. Nothing detracts him. He knows what he must do. The Gestapo are precise, methodical. The Gestapo don't make mistakes. Neither will Helmuth. He has learned to do the waiting right, not to concentrate too hard, not to faint, not to attract attention. Knows the terrible blows and kicks that fainting brings. Knows not to drink in the morning, no matter how thirsty, because at the Hall of Mirrors, prisoners aren't allowed to use the toilet. And when it's his turn for interrogation, he will stick to his story, take all the blame for the radio and the leaflets, convince the Gestapo that Carl and Rudy were just curious onlookers, that Carl and Rudy are not traitors, that the leaflet campaign was all his idea. The Gestapo are precise, methodical. The Gestapo don't make mistakes. Neither will Helmuth. He will do it right. If only he could warn Carl and Rudy. He squeezes his eyes shut. Praise. Suddenly, the door opens and another prisoner is brought into the Hall of Mirrors. Out of the corner of his eye, out of the corner of his swollen eye, Helmuth sees Carl. The Gestapo have made a mistake. Helmuth nearly makes a mistake, too. He nearly calls out to Carl. It takes all his strength to swallow the words in his throat. His throat tightens, swollen thick with words. Carl spots him, too, and a stricken look crosses his face. Keep walking, keep walking, keep walking, keep walking, Will's Helmuth, and Carl does. Ten steps, six steps, three steps from Helmuth, and at that moment, that precise moment, their eyes lock. Helmuth twitches the left side of his mouth. The slightest smile winks his left eye. Not enough attention to attract the guard's attention, just enough to signal Carl. Carl blinks, hesitates, and then a flicker of understanding passes over his face. Helmuth swallows hard, gulps down a sob. He is sure that Carl understands, that Carl that knows that Helmuth has taken the blame. Sure, Carl understands not to say anything that will implicate himself more during the interrogation. Helmuth blinks back tears, wishes he could warn Rudy, wishes he could save them both from interrogation, wishes he could tell them he tried to hold out, wishes he could ask their forgiveness. But there is no way to warn Rudy, and Helmuth does not see him or Carl or Dewar again until the trial six months later at the People's Court of Berlin, the infamous Blood Tribunal, the highest, most feared court in Germany. 6 p.m. A prison guard brings Helmuth paper, a fountain pen, blue ink. For his final letters, the paper, the pen, the ink, they are sweeter than Muddy's plum coochie. Helmuth pulls up his stool to the scratchy table, spreads out the first sheet of paper, smooths it with his hands. He knuckles away tears. What will he tell his family? That he was foolish to think he could wage battle against such evil? No, Helmuth does not believe he was foolish. He did not risk his life in vain. God can bring good out of evil, but God can't do it alone. God needs people, people who will stand up. People who will dare to speak out. For what has a man profited if he has gained the whole world and lost his soul? That's what the Bible says. Helmuth feels something. His chest swells. A warm calmness fills him and he knows that he has lived a life that stood for something. August 4th, 1942. Helmuth leaves for Berlin. A guard handcuffs him, leads him to a green prison transfer van. Helmuth climbs inside, and his heart leaps as he sees Carl and Rudy sitting there. Gerhard Dewar, too. Each boy is handcuffed to a guard, so all Helmuth can do is smile, and smile he does. They all grin at one another, all except for Dewar, who casts his eyes down and stares at his hands folded in his lap. He cannot look Helmuth in the eye. But Helmuth waits for Dewar to look at him, wills Dewar to look at him, and when he does, Helmuth nods and smiles, a mixture of shame and relief, crosses Dewar's face. I'm sorry, he mouths, his eyes pained. Me too, says Helmuth with a nod. Me too. The boys ride in silence. At the Altona train station, the guards herd them into a special train compartment marked Prisoner Transport, Entry Verboten. Once inside, the guards uncuff the boys. Rudy's guard says, If I were a judge, I would give you boys a good thrashing, put you in uniform, and ship you to the front. Let the punishment fit the crime. That's what I say. 
Carl Skard nods, agrees, then points the boys to a bench seat. Sit, you may talk, but I am warning you, do not stand up and not one word about your case. The guard sits across from the four boys, taking out a deck of playing cards. Helmuth looks at Rudy and Carl. Hot tears flood his eyes. I'm sorry, he whispers to them. I tried to hold out. His guard shoots a warning look. Not one word about your case, he says firmly. Helmuth falls quiet. Carl cups his hand over Helmuth and squeezes. So does Rudy. The three friends sit there for the longest while, one hand atop the other. It is Carl who breaks the silence first. Remember when I brought the false teeth to church, he says. Helmuth remembers, and he laughs. For the rest of the trip, the boys swap stories.